All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this month's uh, In the Room for Courageous Parents Network. We are very lucky tonight to have with us the mother and author, Kelly Cervantes, author of the book, Normal Broken. Um, we have had occasion at Courageous Parents Network to do book and author talks when we love a book and we've done them before. We have another one coming up in November and I know we have a few scheduled for uh, 2024. So it is uh, always a pleasure to feature an author who's written something that we at Courageous Parents Network think is a value to to the community, uh, primarily of parents and caregivers, but also of clinicians. Uh, and we're always eager to feature these authors when we encounter such a book. Uh, Normal Broken is such a book. It is the book I wish I had had when my daughter Cameron died. Uh, it would have been extraordinarily helpful to me personally, and I suspect also my husband. It is the book I would have liked. Um, so I want to thank Kelly for writing this book. Um, I will begin by saying that um, I'm going to just read, a, just say a few things that I have loved um, in, in a few instances, and then I'll let Kelly, who you're here to hear, actually speak. Um, here's, here's just to set the tone. In the last few years, there have been few among us that have not shouldered grief that they had previously thought unimaginable, unbearable, even unsurmountable. But grief is not actually any of those things. It is just more pain than we have ever had to overcome before. I love that, Kelly. Um, I love how you normalize grief. As I said, you named all of my stuff and you were so you're so honest about it in this book. Um, and here's one more excerpt that I love. I am left with a gaping void where my child used to be. I am left with an unknown future because my entire existence revolved around her, Adelaide. I am still left with the guilt of acknowledging how easier life is now without her physical presence. I am still left. And I really think that sets the tone for everything that you write about. So without further ado, here is Kelly. And we'll begin, Kelly, if you could just talk a little, if you could just tell the story now of your daughter, daughter Adelaide. How do you tell the story, obviously as succinctly as possible, of Adelaide now, these, these several years later since, since she died? Yeah. So thank you so much for having me here. And thank you, all of you beautiful faces for, for being here and listening. Um, I really, um, this is, this is a whole moment for, for me and, and <clears throat> it's just, I, I'm just, there are no words to say how much I appreciate this. Um, Adelaide, the topic I love more than any other, um, so Adelaide passed away four years ago. I like to think of her as she was when she was cuddling on the couch with her brother and he would be squeezing her too tight and she would slap him across the face and he would yell out from the other room that she had just hit him and and I would have to go in and, and tell my nonverbal, non-mobile daughter who wasn't really paying any attention to me because she did whatever she wanted to do that she couldn't hit her brother and then tell her brother that maybe he needed to not squeeze her so hard. I love to remember how she loved listening to Frank Sinatra um, way more than Baby Shark. Hated Baby Shark, loved Frank Sinatra. Um, I miss reading to her. I miss cuddling with her. I miss the way she smelled. Um, and there are even some days where I find myself missing holding her while she's having a seizure, which seems just so backwards and crazy that I could, I never would have thought that that would even be something that I could miss. And I don't know what kind of twisted trauma that is, but, um, but there are days when I miss her so much that I even miss that. Um, Adelaide, we actually just found out a couple months ago, um, four years after she passed away, that her condition 
is likely a genetic alphabet soup called DEND 5A. It was neurodegenerative, genetic, inherited from Miguel and I, and there was nothing we ever could have done to help her, which is a whole mind journey <laughs> to go on um, at this point in the game. Uh, she passed away five days before her fourth birthday. We had nearly four um, amazing, beautiful, traumatic years with her. And I wouldn't trade a single one of them. It's beautiful. How, how long, how old was she when you learned that she had a condition that was in all likelihood uh, fatal or was it, did you know for sure that it would be fatal? We didn't find out until she was about uh, three and a half. It was really only about six months before she passed that they really confirmed that it was neurodegenerative, that whatever it was, because we didn't know what was causing all of this, but they could see that her brain was quite literally getting smaller and not, not growing, um, and that there was nothing else that they could do. So we found out six months before, and then it took me still several months more to really process that. And then um, by August, mm -hmm. I called in hospice services and by October, she had died. Basically, as soon as I set the ball in motion to make way for her to go, she let us know that she was ready to go. But I mean, she had her, she was diagnosed with hypotonia when she was two months old. We knew pretty early on that something wasn't quite right, mm -hmm. but because it was degenerative, we didn't quite understand the full scope of how not right things were. She had her first seizure when she was seven months old, infantile spasms diagnosis at nine months old. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was, you know, sort of a two steps back, one step forward sort of situation for the rest of her life. Did you, um, you write in the book that, and in, in this moment when you're writing about it, you're, com you're not comparing is the wrong word, but you are acknowledging that there is, a, while, while grief is universal in terms of there are large pieces that we share with anyone who's grieving the loss of a loved one, child, parent, loved spouse, loved one, sudden or anticipated, you do say that something about, which I understood from my own experience to recognize from my own experience, you talk about how um, all the pre-grieving that you did um, after, all the pre-grieving you did when in the years when it was clear that something was going on, helped you accept your lost future with her following her death? which yes. is sort of anticipatory grief, but actually more sophisticated than that or more dimensional than that. Can you talk a little about that? You know, it's interesting because I don't think knowing that she was going to die lessened my grief in any way, but it did lessen the shock of it. It lessened the trauma of it. And so maybe I was able to accept her loss. Although I still feel like it was years before I even truly accepted that she had, that she died, that she had to die, that that, that was the, her life journey. I, you know, it is, I remember laying next to her in bed and my mother was there and I looked at her and I said, I feel like I've been grieving her for so long, the missed milestones, the life I thought that she would have. And now you know, the anticipatory grief of her dying, I, I grieved her so much that I feel like that should count as time served. I should get out of jail earlier, out of grief jail earlier, because I've been grieving her so long. And, and my mother is a therapist. And so she just sort of smiled at me and told me she didn't think it worked that way. Um, and she was right. But to your point, there was I don't know if to call it a softening or what, what it is specifically, but I spoke to um, several friends that I made after their children passed from SUDEP, sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. So their child was there and vibrant and, and 
you know, neurotypical outside of having epilepsy one day and then they're gone the next. And the shock and the trauma that comes with a sudden death. And I I do feel like the moment of her loss was eased a bit because we were expecting it. That doesn't ease the grief, but it eases that moment so that I can look back on the moment of her death. I was holding her in my arms and it was very peaceful. I know that she was surrounded by love. The actual moment of her death is not traumatic to me. And, and I'm of, I guess I'm grateful for that, which sounds bizarre. Grief is so weird, man. (laughs) Well, it's, Given the layers of things that compound, it's nice that that the moment of her death doesn't have to be one of the compounding factors. Yeah. Um, so I there are lots of things that we can we will talk about in this book. Um, and I but I have to be careful because I want to encourage people to actually read the book. So I have to make sure I don't give things away. Uh, I mean, this is not a plot driven book, but you know what I mean. Um, what, can you just say a little bit about what prompted you to write this book? If this is a different sort of book, which is what yeah. appealed to me personally. It's, it, it's practical. It's a part memoir, part practical advice. Um, yeah. It, I, so I wrote, I had been writing my blog inch stones prior to Adelaide passing sort of just about my journey, raising her Um, and caring for her and being this caregiver and this shift in my life. And meanwhile, my husband is Hamilton in Chicago. And we were leading this like just bizarre life with the highest of highs and the lowest of lows all happening at the exact same time. And so I had started writing about that. Um, And then after she died, I didn't want to stop writing. So it just sort of transitioned into me writing about my grief journey. And I found that writing for me was incredibly therapeutic, getting all of these thoughts out of my head where they were amorphous and terrifying and anxiety fuel and constricting them to either pen and paper or a keyboard in in ink, in black and white. They had so much less power over me than they did in my head. And so writing was incredibly helpful. And then being able to get feedback, to be able to hear from people that they could relate. That whole that whole circle was so meaningful to me and so healing for me. And so as I'm trying to figure out what in the world I'm going to do with my life, because I'm not Adelaide's mom anymore as a profession, I will always be her mother, but That is not my purpose and my profession anymore. I've been forced into retirement from this job that I loved. What was I going to do with my life now? And so I turned to this, this passion, this thing that I loved that, that I had found healing in. And originally I actually wanted to write a sort of straight memoir about that time of our life in Chicago And I eventually realized that that was a story I needed to write for me and not necessarily one that needed to be written for public consumption. That was part of the writing that I needed to do to document her life and to make sure that I remembered her life and that my son Jackson would remember her. And um, the book that I discovered that needed to be written that I think that people needed to read was this book, which was Normal Broken. And while I was, uh, while I was writing, I was also trying to read, like I said, my mother is a mental health therapist. So literally I have a stack of books next to my bed of all of these grief prescriptive books telling you guides and, and this is how you're supposed to heal. And I would like get through a chapter and want to throw it across the room because it just, I didn't feel like I was grieving right because I wasn't doing it the way that this book said, or there were the grieving stages, or it just, it felt, it all just felt like too much. And at the end of the day, the only thing I really wanted was for someone to just sit in the dark with me and hold my hand and tell me that they knew how, that this sucked and that, that 
it was okay that it sucked and to let it suck and then to make me laugh. <laughs> and that was, that was what I wanted more than anything. And so that is what I set out to do with this book. That's why it's called A Grief Companion. I want this book to be the friend who's like, yeah, this was, this was the crazy shit that I did that I should not have done, but I did it. And it totally didn't turn out well. And we can laugh about it now. It was not funny in the moment, but let's laugh about it now. And maybe you can learn from this horrible mistake that I made or not. Maybe we both made it and we're going to relate and we're going to laugh about it together. And then we can say, okay, but this is the healthier path forward. This is, this is how I got from a puddle on the floor, from not being able to get out of bed to not feeling like I could be a proper mother to my surviving son to sitting with all of you on a zoom call talking about a book that I've written about my grief journey like that's that's a chasm to get from one place to the other and I'm not I'm not an expert but I have this lived experience and I love using words and I want to be able to be that companion, that friend that I was so desperately looking for in those, those darker days. Well, I think you, this book will feel like a friend to people who, who need it when they need it. Uh, what was the, so for those of you who haven't seen it, the, 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 the I'm not going to read through all the chapters, but the chapters all begin with the word when when getting out of bed deserves a medal, when you realize we all grieve differently, when your greatest fear is socializing, these are just sampling, when you feel like a deranged dancing chicken, when life feels out of focus, um, when you're ready to face the death, when you're ready to be okay, when you're ready to be happy. The last chapter is when you're ready to be happy. Um, and there are a lot of other chapters in here. Uh, Kelly, what was the easiest chapter to write? Ooh, um, when you're facing anniversaries and other meaningful deaths or other meaningful dates. Right. I, I, so it's the shortest chapter in the book, um, which probably makes it the easiest. But actually what I wanted this chapter to be was just like, it sucks. I'm really sorry. It's only 24 hours. And to leave it at that. And my editor was like, no, you can't do that. You actually have to like write more of a chapter there has to be something there you can't and I was like but but they do they just suck and you have to survive them and they're the worst and and she was like yeah 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 okay but figure something out and so I think that was the chapter that I sort of wrote about anticipatory grief a little bit um but there are some of the chapters I mean every chapter has a deeper side and a darker moment in it. But I also try, there's, there's certain ones that are a little lighter than others that I got to have a bit more fun with because, because grief is weird. And, and if we can't laugh after we've been sobbing, um, then I, I, well, maybe I, maybe that's me. I feel like I have a really good sob and then I, will just be laughing afterwards at the most crazy thing because grief does wild things to us. Wild things. Uh, was there a chapter that was the hardest? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, uh, let's see here. When you're ready to face the death and whatever comes after. So in that one, I, I talk about her death leading up to the death um, and sort of how I have coped with her death following. I am not a incredibly religious person. I was raised Presbyterian, um, but it is not something that I have, I have carried into my adulthood. And so there's a spirituality um, that I have had to research and find. And this chapter was particularly difficult because I feel like a lot of the other chapters, they were emotions and things that I had already processed. 
as I was writing this book. Maybe I had only processed them recently, but I I had processed them through writing blogs or in my journals or whatever. That particular chapter, I had to force myself to process and to work through as I was writing it. And it was one of the the final pieces I don't want to say final, but what, but one of the last pieces that I went through that is actually in this book, I have many more pieces of grief to process. I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. But for the purpose of this book, it was, it was the last bit of my journey, even though it's not the last chapter of the book. Um, and so that was, that was hard because I'm reflecting and experiencing and processing all while trying to write this chapter in the moment yeah I mean you've named something that uh you 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 talk about in the book but also I recognize I mean I think we can all recognize is is the difference between expressing your emotion and processing your mo emotion um you have some very comical examples in the book of where you were expressing your grief um and people there's there's we have the werewolf uh, image um, and you'll have to read the book to understand. I mean, that was just a, I, that was one of my favorite parts was the section about the werewolf. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's a very important distinction that expressing your grief is not the same thing as processing your grief. And it is one of those things where you know it when you, you feel the shift when you're expressing is really important but it's not work no it's processing. exhausting all the it's same exhausting. not doing the work and the expressing like you said that has to happen that's part of it right but but the processing is where the healing begins that is where you start to pick apart what it is that you're expressing and why you're feeling that way and get to the bottom of it and try and find ways so that you can function healthier in the future. It's not easy work and it's not necessarily fun, but it's 100% necessary if there's going to be a healthy, thriving happy future, which is something everyone who is grieving deserves. Every one of us deserves that. Do you, um, certainly writing was a form of healing your blog, the, everything you were doing, your blog, your journal, what was ultimately becoming this book. Did you have other outlets for processing? I would see therapists off and on, um, I love my medications. I wouldn't be sitting here without them. I, I, um, I had, I have an incredible circle of friends that I leaned on and I relied on. I did not rely on my husband and that may, you know, I have a whole chapter about this, about how we grieved differently and, um, I love my husband incredibly. I think we actually have a very strong and healthy marriage. We couldn't grieve together. And that was a really hard for, thing for me to accept because I am a person who I can cry by myself, but I really want someone to hold my hand. I need someone to witness my grief so that it feels real in a way. And he wasn't able to do that for me because of his own guilt and his own feelings and his own way that he prefers to express his grief. And so that was something we went to, to marriage counseling to try and, and figure out, to have someone help us discuss what it was that we both needed in our grief. And, and then I came to the conclusion that we put a lot of pressure on our significant others in what we expect them to be for us. We expect them to fill 
all of the roles. And that's just not realistic. If my sink is broken and my husband can't fix it, I'm not going to get mad at him. I'm going to call a plumber. You're going to outsource that, right? So my husband couldn't be with me in the moments of my deepest grief. So I outsourced it. And when Adelaide's one year anniversary was coming around, I asked a friend to come out. One of my best friends who was also grieving Adelaide and she came out and she stayed with us and she laid in bed with me and, you know, ugly cried next to me and then started cracking jokes to get me to laugh at the end, you know? And so she could be that person. And so I was still getting the input and the feedback that I needed to feel like I was being seen and I didn't have to get that from Miguel. So there were, I have lots of friends, the writing, the therapy, the medications, um, but interestingly, not so much my husband. Yeah. Well, I, I, I thought that was an, that's a great example of, of just how honest your book is and uh, how you name all sorts of things and talk about how you coped in ways that were normal. Um, and, and then you offer this like very, you name this thing that wasn't the ideal of what you wanted, which would be a partner who was like do coping exactly the way you would want them to be. But then you just did a really accessible work. You offer a really accessible workaround. Um, which is just great to be reminded of. Did he, did he, um, did Miguel ever get impatient with you for, for your more um, demonstrative or uh, your more demonstrative overt grief from his own or did no, he? No, he didn't. I have to say he was so incredibly patient and understanding. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that because it, it, 100% affected in the, in the early, like the first year to two years, it, it affected my ability to parent our son. I, I mean, I would be incapacitated and he never made me feel like I was a bad mother. He never, he just sort of stepped in and um, took care of things when I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I am very, eternally grateful to him for his patience and understanding that this was the way that I was grieving mm -hmm. and not making me feel any which way about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, um, I have not met him and hopefully I will. And that is very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you, um, uh, oh goodness, what was going to, I can't remember. Um, so the one of the another place where there's some humor and you talk about the importance of humor that both what was helpful to you then and what you tried to infuse into this book is you talk about triggers can you identify um can you identify can you talk about what some of those triggers were for you and oh. uh, uh what do you advice do you have for parents about facing uh or coping facing or coping with their triggers yeah, I probably my most challenging trigger was the grocery store, which I have come to discover is an incredibly common trigger for people is going to the grocery store. And I thought that I was just the weirdest person alive that I just could not. I tried to go to the grocery store after Adelaide died and I nearly had a panic attack standing in front of the the checkout person. I thought, I mean, she must have thought that I I don't know what she thought if I was on drugs or who knows. And I had to go and sit in my car for five or 10 minutes before I even trusted myself to turn the ignition. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. And so there was grocery delivery service and I didn't have to go to the grocery store. And then as things started becoming safer, I would just send Miguel to the grocery store. So I think I actually managed to go close to two years without stepping foot in a grocery store. My mom, again, who is amazing, she was like, Kelly, so 
I think that this is something you need to work through. And I was like, I don't, I have a perfect system. The gal goes to the grocery store. I have them delivered. Why will I ever need to go in a grocery store again? She was like, it's not about the grocery store. It's about facing something that is preventing you from living your full and typical life. You, you do not want to be prevented from doing something by your own emotions. And I was like, well, shit. So I started by going to a grocery, grocery stores that I like driving further away and going to grocery stores that I had never been to before. And I would be like a really short list, like three items in and out. And then I would start going to ones that were a little closer to home or lengthening the list. There's still one grocery store in our town that I hate going to, but I can go to it. I went to it last week. I was very proud of myself. Um, did a full gro grocery trip. Uh, and, and typically after, you know, when I first started going to the grocery store, I would be laid out for the rest of the day. It was exhausting. And I, I would be on the couch or in bed and I was done. That was like my one outing. It took everything it had in me. And then I was done. And, you know, it was baby steps and it took time. It also took me processing what it was about the grocery store that I was having such a difficult time with. Yes, there were the reminders. She was on a ketogenic diet. So seeing avocado, like a whole stack of avocados was like, this, this food item that we used to buy in bulk. And now I, now I don't buy avocados because they, they are a trigger. Also, I could if I wanted to, but I don't very often. Um, what I discovered was at the root cause of my anxiety was having to wait in lines because I started to notice that it wasn't just at the grocery store. It would be anywhere that I had to wait in a line. And it was just at the grocery store was where I most frequently had to wait. And um, I would start to panic that I needed to be home, that something was happening at home and I needed to get there because so many times I had gotten a call from Miguel or from Adelaide's nurse that something was going wrong, that she had had a seizure, that she had stopped breathing and I had just signed a DNR and do you want me to resuscitate her or are we letting her go? The, like These were the calls that I would get. And so standing in line anywhere, I would start to panic because I didn't have control over the situation and I felt like I needed to go. I needed to go home and I needed to go home now. And it was this extreme trauma fight or flight response that I had to address and to work through and acknowledge that that was what I was feeling and why I was feeling it so that I could go into a grocery store or stand in a line again. Yeah. I, I really appreciate your expanding the lens on what that, what that is. And I think what you're um, part of what you're touching on is the it, it it's a bridge that the, the goes to the next point, which is this notion of control and feeling out of control and the and feeling vulnerable. And then now you have this realization, as do any as do all any person to whom something bad has happened, um, that we're vulnerable. You you lived and you in the book. You one of my, one of my other favorite parts of the book is your how you talk about the phenomena of asteroids or not the phenomena of asteroids but the imagined asteroids and we're not going to talk about it because I want people to get the book but <laughs> I really I read that and I was like yes there I I and I'm wondering about potential asteroids all the time and then you have to control that to move mm -hmm. through your day. Um, which is basically post-traumatic, um, post-traumatic response. Yes. The, uh, I want, to, we have, we have lovely questions from pe people I know, 
So I want to make sure we have time for that. But I do, there are a few sections I would love for you to read, if you would please. Yes. Um, the the top uh on the top topic of the work of healing on um page 114 mm -hmm. if you could read from the top of the first graph to the end of the second graph i just think it's a very um beautiful uh description of the work of healing that was true for you yes yeah um i was stuck my disinterest in healing had turned me into a high functioning griever. I no longer spent a majority of my time in the dark, but I was still regularly fighting the temptation to slip back toward that shell. And when I found myself there yet again, I convinced myself that I was comfortable in my cocoon. Sure, it was incredibly dark and cramped and closed off from the world, but I'd made a home here with decorative pillows, plush throws, a cozy rug. I also knew that in order to break out of this cycle, I'd have to make an intense effort. I've never been afraid of difficult work, though I have undoubtedly suffered from a lack of motivation, direction, and self-worth. But until I heard President Biden's words, I didn't understand what kind of work healing would be. It isn't difficult because I'd have to let go of my grief and move on. It is difficult because I have to live with it and still move forward. In some ways, this is bizarrely comforting. Knowing that the grief will always be with me means I don't have to worry about losing it or rather losing this piece of Adelaide that remains. If you lost your arm in a horrible accident, you would never forget what it was like having an arm, but you would learn to function without it. In many ways, this is similar, except instead of a limb, we've lost a chunk of our heart. It's why we create memorials after mass casualty events or place plaques on park benches. Remembering is healing. So the, the piece about President Biden's words, he had said he had given a speech the night before his inauguration. It was a COVID memorial. And he had said in that speech, one of the main lines was, um, to heal, we must remember. And it just knocked me it knocked me back entirely because I had never thought up until that moment about how in order to heal I would have to remember and keep her with me I had up to that point always thought that healing would mean letting her go and moving on and that was never going to happen because that was my daughter and here was someone who was telling me that I could heal and always keep her with me. And that was everything I needed in that moment and moving forward. I love that. Uh, then if you could read, we're going we're gonna to jump to the last one I asked you to read. Okay. Um, on page 186, where you're writing about how the words we use with ourselves and others really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, we can hold both phrases in our mind. Yep. Um, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to be okay. The two are not mutually exclusive. Okay is not even a destination. It's more like a gas station where you stop to refuel on a profoundly long road trip. And it is up to us to reframe our internal dialogue in a way that benefits the life we are now leading. Our internal word choice is just as important as the words we put out into the world. We are surviving, not survivors. Instead of moving on, we are moving forward. Yeah. I think that is such an important distinction uh, because, I mean, anyone who's here um who's lost somebody they love very much knows that you uh are moving forward with the person you love as opposed to moving on from something from someone that you love uh i before we go to the questions uh that came through the emails i'm wondering i i'm thinking maybe we can ask if there are questions from the people, I don't know if the emails came from people who are 
actually here. So I want to honor the people who are here um, and see if anybody has a question, a few a few questions. Okay, Amy, please. Hi, Blake. Hi. Um, hi, Kelly. This has been so great. And I feel like I know you. Like, I feel like so much <laughs> said about your friends and your husband. Uh, well, I guess I should say I live in Boston and I recently lost my son six months ago um, to a brain tumor uh, and have another child who's a cancer survivor. So I've been in uh, the dark room that you described for some time. Ooh, crying in front of a crowd. Great move. Uh, <laughs> um, Let, it Let it happen. Yeah. What I wonder, um, and this is kind of a personal question, but again, I can just relate to so much of what you've said. What I wonder is you mentioned how um, something that was healing for you was friends and people that would sit in a dark room with you and cry and that that allowed you to expect less of your husband who was grieving in his own way. I can relate to every word of that and have such wonderful, deep female friendships. However, none of them are in this situation. They all have normal kids and normal jobs and normal lives and normal marriages. And so I have found less comfort in that than one might expect. You know, I have friends who will say, we'll walk in the darkest places and go to the darkest, you know, conversation topics. But at the end of the day, like, I'm just so acutely aware of the fact that they get to go home. Yes. So how did you navigate that? So again, it is in the way that I think I, I compartmentalized a bit of my relationship with my husband. I was also able to do that with friends. And I sought out other friends who had also lost a child. I um, kind of didn't accidentally. I was maybe two to three glasses of wine deep and signed up for a grief retreat. And then woke up the next morning to an email welcoming me to said grief retreat. And I thought, what did I do? And then decided that um, if it sucked, it would be really great writing material. And if it didn't, then even better. And it didn't suck at all. It was incredible to sit with other women who just understood without even needing an explanation. Um, I, you know, someone would start crying and no one asked them why they were crying. They just sat there and held their hand and gave them a tissue. In meeting these women who also had lost children and not, you know, the different ages, different um, situations, sudden anticipated all across the board um but meeting these women and knowing that they were in my phone that they were on social media that was the first time I felt normal broken was at that retreat where I felt normal in that brokenness because even though I had those friendships and they were grieving my daughter it wasn't their daughter and they could be there for me in that moment. But it, we also need people who are going to be there in the journey with us. And so finding, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be in person. I actually don't see any of these women at the retreat, but we follow each other on social media. And so then it, it impacts my social media feed where I'm seeing them remember their children. And so it just normalizes talking about the grief and talking about our children who aren't with us anymore in a way that is just healing to have child loss acknowledged in a regular way. Um, and so that was where I found that support and circle and belonging and normalness if that makes sense does and it's helpful thanks mm -hmm. thank you amy i'm really glad to see you amy uh you. jennifer you have i'm so hand sorry up. i'm so sorry i about i said just you're in the thick of it and it sounds like back to back yeah 
So I just, my heart goes out to you. It really freaking sucks. Indeed. Um, Jennifer. Hi, Kelly. Um, I feel like I'm fangirling right now because I <laughs> have totally been following your blog. Um, unfortunately, when I became in the thick of it was right when Adelaide was, you know, towards the end of her journey. Um, I've been reading your blog ever since. Um, I know I like post all over your social media. Um, my daughter Harper passed away back in March of 22. Sorry. Um, and I went to said grief retreat that you went to as well and definitely had the same exact experience. What am I doing? And this is so amazing at the same time. Um, but since following your journey and, um, totally have your book pre-ordered, can't wait, you could sell me anything. Um, <laughs> I will buy it all. Um, and I will also read it for free on your blog, but <laughs> when you decided to expand your family, um, I just want to know, cause we're kind of in that motion, but at the same time, like I have a hard time thinking that people are going to think I'm trying to replace the child that I lost. So how did you guys come yeah. to that conclusion and be able to, you know, I don't want to say defend um, what you did, but like not feel judged and just, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is so nice to be able to, to chat with you in person. First of all, thank you for all of those amazing words and, uh, I, I'm just my heart and, and Harper. I, so, um, in November of 21, two years after Adelaide passed, um, we got a call that, um, our, uh, a family member was not going to be able to care for their, child anymore and was asked if we could take her. However, prior to that, we had decided that we were going to adopt it. So we were actually well into the process of um, an international adoption and then put that on hold and, and brought Anessa into our family. And actually that adoption was just finalized earlier this summer. Um, I, Jennifer, I feel every emotion that you are talking about. It was, um, it was so challenging. I think maybe because I have the blog that helped me because I could put out into the world and say, I am not replacing Adelaide. We are bringing another child in. We are growing our family. We are adding our family. I have so much more love in my heart. Um, and that helped me to be able to publicly say that so that maybe people wouldn't feel that way. Um, and then at some point, I think, I realized also in talking to people that I I don't know that anyone actually is looking at us and judging us that closely about these decisions that we make for our family. I think that the people who are close to us and want good things for us want us to do what is in our hearts. And if we want to grow our families and then adopt and grow your family or have another child or do whatever it is that you need to do to fill your heart. And I, I still struggle sometimes with, with some of that guilt and, and, or just, you know, that there is this I have this daughter who is getting to appreciate all of these joys in life that Adelaide didn't get to. And, and that is hard, but on the other side of that, I know that Adelaide is so freaking happy that I can be happy again. Sometimes it feels like maybe she sent Anessa into our lives because she brought sunshine and laughter into a home that had had a laughter drought, a, a two year laughter drought. So I, I think we have to worry less about what people are going to think and the people who love us are going to be happy for us and support us and everyone else can shove it. I love your honesty. <laughs> well, 
I, I am. I <laughs> I could not agree more. Uh, and I just want to jump in and say, you know, um, Jennifer, we we knew our daughter, youngest daughter, was going to die, and we knew we didn't want our older daughter to be an only child. So rather than just having the two children that we had always planned to have, we went forward with another pregnancy because you could we could do testing and we had our own decision making around that. So in some ways, our third daughter was a replacement for our second daughter because we never intended to have three children and we and we we stand by that and we've told her that it, it there was an inevitability to her because her her sister brought her into our life and we don't hide behind this but it doesn't take away from the power of her existence um because the minute she was born she became inevitable and and we own it and nobody's ever said anything to us about it. So I'm with Kelly, shove it. <laughs> um, so uh, we have, um, we're gonna, uh, uh, let me ask Kelly, do you have time to go like a few minutes over? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So I have my mom in town this week, so she's on kid duty, it's great. Okay, <laughs> somebody had their hand up, but then I think the hand just came down. Maybe Sha Shauna, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Kelly, um, first of all, my, um, you were saying about with anniversaries, um, my youngest daughter, uh, so I have two Greek goddesses. I have Athena, my oldest, and my youngest, Selena. So I have the Greek goddess of wisdom and war, and boy, does she take after her name. And Selena is the Greek goddess of, of the moon. Um, uh, so Selena was born. October 24th, 2014. And then at exactly two and a half years old to the day on April 24th, 2017, while laying on my chest at Boston Children's Hospital, she took her last breath. Um, then nine months later on January 9th, 2018, um, my mom in UMass Memorial took her last breath. Um, that same afternoon, I received a call from, um, Boston children's genetics team and they identified a mutation and Selena is now part of a scientific journal, uh, article. She's one of the first 30. Um, but every six months I call what Selena, you know, she just would have turned nine years old on the 24th, just two days ago, Selena's sunrise and sunset. So trying to find those joys, those happy times. And, you know, and I actually just finished an amazing piece and finding those, those happy times and, um, you know, the yin and yang. Um, but I did want to ask because unlike your amazing ability, which I will confess, I am buying your book because I don't have that eloquent ability to put the feelings that I've been experiencing over the last almost decade now. Um, in this journey, I don't have that ability to put my feelings that I've been experiencing into words. Fantastic at telling a, a story. Put me on the stage, no problem. Put me on public speaking, not a problem. But writing it down? So I really wanted to ask how you got through that process. Um, blogging, I, I get that. But, you know, is... <laughs> Can can you give can you give a pointer in another process to to kind of get that journaling out because I know how important that is. I've, I've, you know, I'm also a veteran. I'm a female veteran. I spent eight years in the army. One too many punches by the snake. Um, talk about some PTSD all around. You know, woo. Um, <laughs> um, so you know, really all that kinds of things. Just one thing after another. What would you suggest for somebody that? is is just having that ebb and flow those waves of grief we yeah. all know how that goes yes. what would you recommend for somebody that has that writer's block but is not a writer uh, what about voice memos voice memos because, yeah because you say Ooh, that you that's a great voice. idea you say if you can tell a story you can write a story because actually what i my writing is it it is so conversational and it is it is i write what I, how I would say it. 
So I would say that you can write. Um, if you can tell a story, then you can write. But I would also suggest if there's like some sort of um, something stopping you, you could do um, voice memos, have it dictate. You can do dictating into, and then that will write out what you're, what you would want to say for you. And then you still have it on print. I think it's important to be able to look at it and to be able to see it and to go back and be able to reread it. And if you had a voice diction program, which most computers have these days, just built into them, then um, I think you could get a similar effect. Mm, that's a great suggestion. And that's a great suggestion, uh, Kelly. Uh, all right, so here's some questions from the register, some people who sent them ahead of time. The, um, you've seen this, uh, several are related to planning Adelaide's service. Mm -hmm. Had you, did you pre-plan it? Did you know what your vision was? We did not. I was not capable of pre-planning the service. Um, we had, I, we knew that we were going to have her cremated because we were in Chicago when we were moving. We knew days after she died that we were moving back to New York. So um, I had reached out to a funeral home. I had, but I had not planned any bit of her service. That all happened after she passed away because my brain, even though we knew she was dying, my brain couldn't go there. Um, but oh my goodness, if someone can pre-plan that, I think that they should. Um, we were so fortunate to be surrounded by an incredibly talented and creative community. Um, although not, I mean, not just, I mean, the cast of Hamilton sang at her service and that was beautiful. We had them sing children's songs and, and that was, that was incredible. Um, not baby shark, which she hated, but, um, nice, beautiful songs from like, Dis <laughs> <laughs> um, my brother in law read a poem and we had a dear friend of ours sort of MC it all. And it kind of came together. Miguel, I picked the songs. Miguel put a lot of the programming together along with our friend um, who emceed it. Um, and then we had incredible help. It was because we were in Chicago, because Miguel was Hamilton, we were in this very bizarre place where her death was public. Um, like it made the news, which was a very weird thing. Um, and so Broadway in Chicago, the, the local organization that um, plans the Broadway shows and tours that come through Chicago, they helped us put together like the venue and the location um, and security and all of the things that I never even could have wrapped my head around uh, because there, I wanted it to be public mostly because I couldn't even begin to think about putting together a guest list or making sure that everyone knew about it. And because our social media was public, I was like, well, if I'm going to put it out there, then I guess everyone is going to be invited. 400 people were there. It was, um, it was remarkable and it was special and we felt so loved and I was so I was unsure of how I would feel having so many people there that I didn't know, but it just, it filled my heart to know that her life had touched this many people. And even if some of these people, a lot of those people had never met her before, they still wanted to be there and honor her and support us. And, um, and that was really beautiful. Not fun to plan. I'm a planner. I love planning parties. I did not. And then the reception afterward, I outsourced to my event planning friends from New York. We found a venue and I said, do it, please. 
and they did and it was perfect and it was lovely and I didn't have to think about it <laughs> that is uh, that is uh, I think that is a great way to get your friends who are flapping about trying to be helpful to be helpful is to say you go organize this thing uh, we had uh, I mean we didn't have the crowds for the same obviously for obvious reasons but you know we my sister is an event planner and she planned the service we told her what we wanted to be in the service but she got the books printed she made sure there was a mic she outsourced the caterer my sister-in-law did all the decorations we just gave it to friends kept them busy yeah and just allowed us to not. I was also surprised our funeral home did a lot for us too yeah. like a lot of graphic design work they like they put together the programs for us all we had to do was get them printed it's um I really was impressed with how much the people who are already in our orbit be it the funeral home or the hospice services or how how much they actually did to help us with all of that as well yeah, there's um, funeral homes when it's a child who dies are often very, very compassionate and will go above and beyond for families. Um, so I encourage people, if they're in that situation, to ask. Uh, speaking of hospice, Kelly, we did have a question about what your experience with hospice was. We had an incredible experience with hospice. I was very reticent. I have um, a very close relationship with Adelaide's nurse who was with us 40 hours a week for almost two years. And I was terrified that if we entered hospice services that we would lose her. And so I had to like double check everything and then go back and triple check and make sure because I wasn't going to do it if we couldn't have her with us. Um, and in the end, it it all worked out. And and I didn't, I, I certainly didn't understand what hospice services were, or what that meant walking into it. I kind of figured, well, Adrian and I, Adrian and I, her nurse, and I have done it tag teaming this entire time. Why can't we do this too? And what I'll say, I, it was an incredible benefit to both of us. There was someone there for our nurse to bounce ideas off of and to get reference points from, they were obviously able to come in with the morphine and the heavier drugs when Adelaide was experiencing more serious pain. But there were also the services. They brought in a music therapist. Adelaide was able to have massages. They, um, there was a social worker that they brought in that um, probably under different circumstances, if Adelaide had been more neurotypical, would have been someone that could have met with her. But instead, we had them meet with Jackson, our son. And so he he was already in and out of therapy at that point. But this was someone dedicated who came to him in the home, who helped us explain to him what was happening and what was about to happen. Because Jackson then and to this day hates talking about Adelaide's death or illness with us because he's a doesn't want to upset us so he has always been more comfortable talking with a third party and so that was incredibly beneficial but then it was the little things it was um they taught me how to take her fingerprint so that I could have a necklace made that had her fingerprint on it they helped us make a cast of Jackson and Adelaide holding hands. It was these little mementos that mean the world to me that they helped facilitate. And then on top of that, because we had all of this extra help in the home, I got to, for the first time, I wasn't on the phone with insurance. I wasn't running to the pharmacy to get all of her medications they were calling her doctors. And for the first time since she was like two months old, I got to be her mom, like just her mom and not her full-time caregiver. And that was magic. That was, that was everything. Mm -hmm. Just to, to only wear one hat, to just be able to be her mom for once. Mm -hmm. That was, that was amazing. 
that was, no one can ever top that gift. I'm really glad that it got to the denouement could be like that for you with her. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for your time. Your, I mean, you speak as you write, both beautifully, eloquently, ways that are accessible, um, inviting, but also intense. It's a, it's a beautiful balance that you strike. And I really, really strongly recommend this book um, for anyone who needs it for themselves or to give to somebody who you think would benefit from it. Of course, um, Kelly's, the loss she writes about is specific to, to child loss, but this is relevant to anyone who's lost somebody um, really, really close to them. Um, and you do open it up up in your terminology to not just make it be about child loss, but the, your example is obviously about your daughter and there that's landed really squarely with me beautifully. Um, I'm going to stop recording. I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you, Blythe. Thank 